someone going to give me a cue? I guess we will. Yes, sir. Well, since the lights are down, it must be time for us to start talking, right? <laughs> well, welcome. I'd like to uh, extend a, a happy, joyous uh, welcome to our concluding session for the Executive Communication Summit that has been ongoing all day today. And I hope lots of you had opportunities to participate in the sessions and workshops. And um, we have some wonderful guests with us this evening. It's like sort of like friendship time for me, and then got, just got to meet Steve. So um, it's just a delight to have Steve with us. He's managing director of the, um, I always want to say the old name, don't I? Right. You know why. MSL. <laughs> the MSL office in Seattle. And he's also the director of the food and beverage section of the MSL group. And I was joking with him earlier, saying my firm was an, a Manning, Salvage, and Lee affiliate. So if I come out with that this evening, forgive me. <laughs> Our next guest, um, a good friend from PRSA, Ron Kolb. So happy to see you again, Ron. He's a consultant and professional director of the graduate program in public relations and advertising at wonderful DePaul University in Chicago, one of my favorite cities, of course. <laughs> and our not last ever guest is Ron Sachs, who is president and CEO of Ron Sachs Communications. Also, some of you have seen him when he's been here for advisory council meetings in the past. And he's also owner of the Sachs Media Group and is based in Jacksonville, Florida. So if you'll help me. Oh, and I'm Deanna Pelfrey. I think some of you know that. Uh, I'm a member of the faculty in the public relations department here at the College of Journalism and Communications at UF. And it's a pleasure to be with you. And let's welcome our guest this evening. <laughs> I thought what we would do this evening is start with one question and have each of our speakers address that question. And then following it, we will have a single question for each of them. But of course, you know, I know them well enough to know they're not going to possibly be quiet after one person answers. And they'll probably pop in and add some wonderful pearls of wisdom to it. And then after that, we'll stop and have questions from all of you. So um, we're relaxed, we're comfortable tonight, and I'm not sitting back because, as we know, my feet would be dangling if I did. So <laughs> um, we all are familiar with and I think have a great deal of respect for the Edelman Trust Barometer. And I thought that we would start this evening with some of the results of the recent 2015 Edelman Trust Barometer. The um, trust in business, once again, has declined. And we're faced with a uh, really difficult situation in which statistically the majority of countries now sit below 50% with regard to trust in business. And only four out of 10 people trust CEOs. With that sort of environment, what do you suggest CEOs and other executives do in communications to begin to train, change that perception? Go ahead, right Ron. Okay. Sure. Well, uh, no matter what the numbers are, I wouldn't limit the low esteem that people hold uh, for CEOs to be just in business. I think almost every major institution in the country has betrayed the public trust in a colossal way in recent history. And so across the board, uh, in any sphere of influence, these institutions, whether it's business or government or the church, have a lot of work to do to rebuild, maintain, and strengthen public trust. Communication is a key to a lot of that. And as I said uh, earlier today in a, in a workshop, in my own experience, about 20% of the CEOs I've run into in the public sector, the private sector, the not-for-profit sector are effective communicators. The rest, 80%, I think are fairly mediocre or worse. And what's worse than them being mediocre and bad is the arrogance of power that comes with the job that uh, keeps some of them in a sense of false security and comfort and an unwillingness to engage in the kind of effective communications that involve candor, transparency, and proactive activities to build a brand, to strengthen a brand, and to regain public trust. Ron, second Ron. Well, the one thing I can say is it's still 30 percentage points higher than politicians. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. So uh, to, to Ron's point, it, it definitely is a, a, a serious issue because uh, the, the, the whole foundation of business and, and the way we operate in a free enterprise system depends on a higher trust level than we seem to be uh, stooping to. I, I totally agree that part of the, the problem is CEOs, certainly over the past uh, uh, 10 years, have 
become aware that they need to do something about it, but they're still pointing at us to make it happen. <laughs> and they need to do a selfie and get themselves yeah. in the picture. And until that happens, I think that uh, they're, they're too dependent because it's easier to yell at us uh, that something isn't happening than get fully engaged. This, the more enlightened CEOs that are aware that they need to do that are you know, putting people in communications functions at that infamous table and asking and seeking their advice and saying, what should I do? Let's, let's, really, let's, let's study what we need to do as far as how is this going to play with all of our stakeholders just rather than just how it's going to play with me and my board chairman, uh, who I really report to. Uh, I think that's that's uh, really fundamental to make the change within uh, business. They're coming along. They're realizing they have to, but it's slower coming than I thought it would be, especially in the social media era. Well, I think there is hope, actually, uh, and millennials are pointing the way. Um, what we've discovered in a study we conducted in 17 nations of millennials, and we asked them about business citizenship and what they expect a business, want from business, what we learned is they, they actually, unlike the prior generation who didn't trust business, they looked to government, uh, millennials are actually looking to business. They have far more confidence that, that business can solve the problems of the world. In fact, they think that only business and uh, right-acting businesses can change things. So that is, to me, a terrific entree for a CEO who wants to set about you know, solving the problems of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, take the attention off your company alone. Drive your business through purpose. And uh, by segment, the, the topics and issues vary, but I know in the food segment, my particular interest, uh, consumers say, we want healthier foods to be more affordable, um, more accessible to more people. Um, and that's, to me, that's a terrific guiding uh, light. You know, so there, and there are companies and organizations that are taking advantage of that. One of them is Wild Oats. They used to be a retail brand. Mm -hmm. I mentioned them earlier today. They are now making organic and natural foods accessible at the same price as any other, and uh, like in, on Walmart shelves. So anyone and everyone can access them. I mean, that is a, a world-changing view. And, uh, and across the board, there was one interesting thing uh, that, that emerged, and that is millennials were looking for, they're concerned about sustainability and environment. One of the, one of the fastest growing issues, they're looking for companies, for, for more kindness in the world. So for companies and CEOs to simply show more kindness, they're going to find a resonant audience, and that will build trust. Do you think the pace of innovation is a tractor from trust? Uh, sure, change is scary, it's destabilizing. <laughs> I was in a, a workshop where there was this blinding inside, it seems obvious, but uh, they, this, it was a cha digital change management or, uh, workshop, and this group every week would have an, a new group of executives in to talk about how the digital revolution is changing their lives and how they have, have to adapt to it. And, and they heard over and over again from executives well, you know, once this internet thing calms down and things get stabilized, you know, then we'll get reorganized. And that what they keep saying to these people is, no, no, you don't understand. Things will never change as slowly as they're changing right now. So you have to get really comfortable with change. You have to make change your business model, constant change. Um, and that's unsettling to executives who started their, their life in a very much more stable world and who at heart have the fear factor operating all day long every day, yes? Well, and they better because they're <laughs> yeah. likely to be replaced within 18 months. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Maybe a machine that will come along <laughs> that will be able to be the CEO, right? There, there was some interesting research from Weber Shandberg I was just reading that reports that 80% of global CEOs and 76% of Fortune's uh, most powerful women in business actually engage socially every day. This is part of their operation. And um, the, the term that seems to be s surfacing is the social CEO. Um, what do you think is the impact of the social CEO? And do you see this delivery um, approach to communication in evolving for executives over time? Ron? There, there are uh, unfortunately far too few of them. Uh, e every uh, um, chief communications officer I know is trying to do something in the social space with involving the CEO. And uh, they will 
say maybe you ought to do a blog, and maybe it can be an internal blog, or maybe it should be both internal and external. And so they create all of these potential social platforms for them, and if they talk them into it, which is the biggest battle at first, uh, then they finally do a couple, and then they get some negative feedback. It only takes one person to respond, and it's a failure. And then they said, well, maybe not this week. We don't need to do one this week. And the next thing you know, if it's not, uh, uh, if you don't stay involved in it, um, no one's going to follow you and no one's really going to pay much attention or come back. So I think that the commitment really does have to come from the top and they have to be convinced there's value in it. I did a survey of media people uh, and media leaders thinking that, you know, they must be because they're all talking about uh, how digital the media is becoming. So I took 100 uh, top people in media who had management roles or maybe um, a, uh, a person who was a reporter on the news. So I did a, a, a cross-section of them, and I was stunned with how few of them actually uh, have followers uh, on Twitter, or they might have 77 was the lowest I found. And, and then when I saw why, the last thing they posted may have been three months ago. And these are people involved in the media. So there's still a long way to go to get people to really embrace social. I mean, some of us who are more active in it are, are totally enamored and we think everyone should, uh, but not everyone does. And uh, I think when CEOs uh, get fully enlightened, they're, they're going to be far more receptive to do it. Until then, I, I still think it's really in, in its infancy as far as the C-suite. Do you think it will move? Will it really uh, oh, yeah. evolve? I, I think that what happens, younger CEOs are coming on, back to the mm -hmm. life expectancy of a CEO. Uh, <laughs> fine, there, there are others out there. And I'm working with a couple of C young CEOs now in the, in the startup space. They're there every day. And they know that, that somebody who's a potential investor is following them. And they, they'll call or they'll send a note saying, guess who just started following me on Twitter? And then, you know, I looked them up because I don't know the name. And I look up the, the person who's like, oh, this is, this is somebody running a major private equity firm. You want them following you. And so they get it. And I think that it's going to take, it's, it's going to be transitional, but very definitely it's coming as younger people are moving into the corner office. I heard a great story recently about a fashion brand in London that was looking for a really tech-savvy CEO for their corporation. So in the search, they used a headhunting firm, and in the search, they did a request to the candidates to do a Vine video, to do a Pinterest board, wow. and to create a resume, and this was my favorite part, that did not include their education or their work experience. Wow. And they went from there, and they did find a CEO, and we're happy as clams because here we're going to have someone who really does understand the tech-savvy population that we're dealing with and audiences we're talking with all the time. So do you think that trend might pick up and take off? Uh, what do you I hope think? not. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I would just say uh, I, I own a small business that's 20 years old. I've got 32 employees. And uh, if you want to submit a, a set of credentials to me, it better be more than a photograph of you looking good in a suit or a dress. <laughs> uh, I'd like to go back to an earlier thing. That as we sit here tonight, a wildly successful businessman who openly acknowledges that he took advantage of U.S. bankruptcy laws uh, yeah. to save himself a fortune and make a fortune at the expense of stockholders and others mm -hmm. is the front runner for the presidency of the United mm -hmm. States, at least on one principal party. Says an awful lot about how the uh, substance of shallowness can carry you a long way. It doesn't mean it's a good thing. So toward your earlier question about the social CEO, I think it's a phenomenon that's here to stay, as you've acknowledged. But I think the downside of it uh, is that this highest level of connectivity in human history, we also are experiencing the beginning of the end of traditional forms of communications that are more connected on a one-to-one -one level. I would surmise that anyone in the audience, if I asked, uh, raise your hand if you've written something longhand, other than please send money, mom or dad, and a Father's Day card uh, to someone you love in the past six months that we wouldn't have that many hands go up. We're losing uh, the ability to write effectively that aren't tweets, uh, that aren't these shallow communiques that Donald Trump tweets every day does not comfort me about the future. So I would say that while, you know, 
we have the technology and the capability to have this great connectiveness and to be in touch with each other in, in unprecedented ways, let's not lose the ability to sit across the table from another guy or gal, have a cup of coffee, and not be in our crotches with our devices, but be in the, the, the eyesight of one another and talking to one another. Other comments on that? Same issue. Well, I, I, not necessarily the political side. Yeah, but. no, but I, I, I definitely think that provocation is encouraged by this social media environment, yeah. mm -hmm. and that, that is yeah. the art of Donald Trump, right. pure and simple, exactly. uh, because provocation is shared. Uh, and there are some examples in the corporate world that the CEO of T-Mobile is just openly confrontational with his brands. He'll put them to the challenge. Uh, it's it's part of the business strategy. You know, they yep. they buy out contracts. They they you know cha openly challenge their competitors, and it's very unconventional. And yet, it's been very successful. So, and I I don't you could probably cite other examples, but I think when you are measuring the success of your message by the, the amount of shares and likes and so forth, it will draw out the CEO and bashful, mm -hmm. tightly controlled, legally approved, public relations agencies, you know, carefully tweaked and submitted and then eventually published a week later. That's just not going to cut it in that kind of environment. You know, no one will be listening. You might publish, but there will be no listeners and shares. You've got to step out. Mm -hmm. There's a, a publisher of uh, new media, some of you may have heard, named Peter Schorsch. He's kind of a good friend of mine. He publishes a bunch of things, St. Peter's blog, Sunburn. And he was uh, in St. Peter, Tampa, going through a Starbucks. And they were doing some promotion at that Starbucks. This is about six months ago that uh, when you come up to the window, listen, uh, the guy in front of you paid for your coffee. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to pay for the coffee for the person behind yeah. you? And like 300, 400 people said, sure, pay it forward and all that hoo hockey. Anyway, when Peter got to the window, Peter being a really pain in the neck, uh, uh, in your face kind of guy, said, is this money going to charity? Uh, and they said, no, it's just a promotion. He said, no, I'm not paying for the coffee for the guy behind me. Thank you for the free one the guy in front of me bought. He broke, he broke the chain and his unwillingness to participate, you know, made Starbucks feel bad. But it got Peter a story on the six o'clock news. And, and I think it, it points out something that all this technology, I, I love what you said earlier, People will prefer to engage with an organization, whether it's a company or a government or a nonprofit, if it engages in selfless service, in corporate right. social responsibility, mm -hmm. even if it's not a corporation. And that means the best way to sell often is not to sell, but to give away knowledge or to give away service. So I like that aspect mm -hmm. of using these tools for those purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, really building on that note, um, I know there was a recent Arthur Page conference and there was quite a bit of discussion about that very concept. You know, we've, we've known of the idea of IQ being important in, in success for a very long time. And then it was replaced a bit with EQ, the emotional question, the emotional intelligence. And now there's conversation about the societal intelligence and the, that aspect of what corporations need to do to begin to build that kind of engagement. Um, the uh, recipient of the Hall of Famer at uh, the uh, Arthur Page Society Conference, uh, that award, um, really challenged folks to move in that direction to the societal touch. Do you think as the uh, individuals who we often think of as the conscience, the, C the CCO who's in the C-suite, um, think of us as the conscience of that C-suite occasionally, <laughs> at least that's been always my belief, um, that, that we should be encouraging this kind of societal focus on issues by our corporate CEOs and executives? I think they largely want to, and that they also try to align it with the brand because it'd be mm -hmm. irresponsible not to make sure right. they work. Companies 30 years ago... It was whatever the CEO and his or her spouse wanted to do. In most cases, <laughs> his spouse. Um, what you know, they're on the Art Institute board, or they're on the Field Museum, or the Lyric Opera. Right. And lo and behold, that's where all of the charitable giving went. Yes, it did. <laughs> and today, those major institutions are under serious threat because the CEO is listening to. Uh, people in the organization and what society is demanding. And they're saying, maybe we need to rethink how we do this. Mm -hmm. 
And all of a sudden, and I've talked to several of them, million dollar grants were pared down. They did it responsibly. They'd, they'd take like 25% a year. And all of a sudden, that additional money then would go to other causes that more directly supported what that brand mission is for the company. And as a result, a lot of nonprofits have benefited and new ones have started because of that uh, approach. I think I'm very positive about where it's going. Uh, I, I think it actually went faster than I thought it would because I, I thought that uh, the spouses would uh, have more influence. <laughs> Maybe. <Yeah. laughs> Other comments? Steve, did you want to comment on that? Well, that, that is interesting. And, and maybe you could say all those years of um, b buddy club uh, mm -hmm. giving uh, <laughs> led those institutions to lose sight of their uh, constituency, right? Because their constituency was the rich board members. Absolutely. Um, and mm -hmm. so they built an organization that satisfied them. Whereas, you know, they, and, and that also <laughs> limited their reach in the community. So, yeah, social intelligence would tell them, you you know, you've got to bring people in, and not just the wealthy. Bring a broad constituency in. Bring in minority communities. Bring in working class people, and make the art or whatever relevant to them. Um, and there are, there are movements in that direction. The symphony orchestras now are bringing in hip hop artists to collaborate with the, with the symphony, and it's a source of great excitement. For years and years, they would play the standard canon, and the audience would get grayer and grayer. And they've recognized that that's a losing strategy. Uh, and certainly, in a world where business wants to align with mission, uh, they better figure out what theirs is. You, you were saying, Ron, that um, the alignment needs to be with the brand. Um, I think Harvard Business Review just named the CEO, the best performing CEO in the world, and it's the head of Novel Nord, which is a co company that focused on diabetes. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they, they've done some wonderful things in, in fitting in with this whole societal intelligence approach, but the performance has been enormous. Um, do you think that that will help build the trust again? Absolutely. The, what will occur is, is um, especially success will breed more success, and I want some of that, the other CEO says. <laughs> exactly. And that, that's where it's going to ch change a lot. The Good Old Boys Network still exists in the, in the mega brand nonprofits. And I'm involved in a couple, and it's like, how much can you give? And it better, and, and the price keeps going up because the demand is going up, because people are now giving more broadly to a lot more causes. We're still giving more money than we've ever given in our lives before, but there's also twice as many nonprofits as there were 20 years ago. So that creates a need, and so they're asking for bigger checks, which I think the, the top nonprofits are still pretty much saying um, we need the big check writers. But what's happening is people are, if those big check writers are saying, I can only go so far. In the mm -hmm. olden days, what, what do we need right. to balance the books? That's right. Mm -hmm. And together we can do that. What millennials said on this point, they had good coaching for his executives. They said, we want you to do what you can naturally do as, as a company. If you're a yep. car company, don't focus on like giving to kids sports or whatever. Right. Be better as a car company. Do go through your entire business practices and ask, you know, what can we do for the environment? Can we make roads safer? How can we better accommodate families? Uh, how can we, you know, be responsive to the different communities? Um, how can we be a positive force in that respect? How for our employees would, in a city like Detroit, can we make uh, a lot a better mm -hmm. transition? That's what they want companies to do, not pure philanthropy, purpose driven business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I think it's still the, uh, the free enterprise system has at its core that a CEO and a chairman of the board are only going to stay in those jobs if they make money. So all the <laughs> philanthropy, all the social corporate responsibility is great for companies that get it, but for those who are still driven by the profit motive, we see the colossal betrayal of public trust. We yeah. talked about it earlier today. Volkswagen you know, lies about right. 11 million emissions yeah. tests, and then the CEO dances out on stage in like a tennis outfit uh, <laughs> saying he's sorry. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen a five-year-old apologize for breaking a cookie jar with more <laughs> contrition <laughs> and sincerity. A genuine delivery. And then delivery. you have in the pharmaceutical industry alone, which is hammering us with 60-second ads, 
uh, I don't remember the name of the drug, but one of them that's supposed to help psoriasis. First 20 seconds are about how the drug can help you, and the next 40 are the required <laughs> FDA disclaimer on how it can hurt you. So the drug for psoriasis, one of the side effects for a certain number of people who take it, is severe psoriasis. <laughs> and then the drug that's supposed to help you lower your cholesterol, one of the possible side effects for a certain percentage of people mm -hmm. who take it is actual death. Yeah. So it's like, gee, Ryan's last cholesterol count was really good, but it's so sorry we lost him at such yeah. a young age. <laughs> and, uh, so we have an industry that, that has to disclaim what it can do to hurt us in its drive to, to sell to us in profit. I think what we haven't talked about much yet is that in the confluence of advertising and social media and public relations, uh, advertising is you paying your own money mm -hmm. to say good stuff about yourself. All right? Yeah. Social media is kind of the same thing, but when somebody who's credible mm -hmm. and is not you says it about you, it means something different and it breaks through differently. And that's why I think the public relations professionals who can use the other tools are going to help corporate America and the other institutions fault, hopefully, into a more trusted place. And those audiences will respond, but they'll also recommend. That's right. Absolutely. And, and that's the best you can have, is it not? I'd say, though, there's a, a, a caution I would, would render that a lot of opinion on social media is now paid, disclosed yes, or Absolutely. not. And I, if you think mm. back a few years, <laughs> uh, there arose incredible skepticism of celebrity spokespeople on news broadcasts because it became pretty evident pretty soon that they were paid to endorse this cholesterol drug or whatever. Or the ED uh, drug. Yeah. Exactly. I said ED uh, drug. Yes, yeah, a song. famous politician. Uh, yeah, Bob Dole. Up on that. Uh, right, so if that same practice merely migrates to social media, um, I think that it will discredit those third-party spokespeople. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, that's why I think purpose-driven marketing is so important. Actually do something that people will praise without payment. That's the win. Ron, you made a reference a few minutes ago to the Volkswagen debacle that's going on, and we certainly watched Tony Hayward and the BP uh, oil spill in the Gulf say some things that uh, certainly didn't help the corporation, and he was quickly on his way back home finding his own life again. Yes, as I think he was <laughs> complaining that he didn't have any more. Um, do you think that uh, the time has come when the standard apology for uh, doing things you shouldn't have been doing to start with and probably knew it should go away? To me. Anybody who wants it. I, 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 <laughs> I want to throw that one up for all of you. Volkswagen CEO or the BP guy uh, understating the severity of the oil spill mm -hmm. uh, that represented a great threat to Florida's ecology, tourism, all sorts of things. Uh, I think uh, being smart and being strategic uh, involves getting counsel from people whose advice you may not want to take, people mm -hmm. with expertise right. like uh, we're teaching here at the University of Florida. And... Uh, uh, you have to be bold enough to be polite but pushy with a CEO about what should mm -hmm. be said and how it should be said. Whoever advised the Volkswagen CEO probably should be fired, in my opinion. And similarly, uh, Tony, as you said, uh, got retired uh, by his rapidly. own bad behavior. Yes. I think contrition uh, has to be genuine, and people can see through BS if it's a facade. And so I, I do think people with the communication skill set are the best ones to advise and consult. In fact, I'd go so far as to say some of the best CEOs of the future are going to come from the ranks of good communicators. I, I think that um, I am amazed how a sincere apology still is always the best policy. Mm -hmm. And we are the most forgiving nation I could ever imagine if someone believes it. Now, if it, yes. when I had to write apologies when I worked for uh, corporations, <laughs> and I'm like... Me the too. lawyer's finished. <laughs> uh, people didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get anyone in a lab coat uh, to discuss it because they didn't necessarily believe it. Right. And so it didn't fly. But if it's, it, we, we know the BS meter will go off if it's not a sincere apology. But if it's a sincere apology, I think it is just absolutely a magical moment. Mm -hmm. And we're going to forgive people for just awful things. And I think Volkswagen could have done a lot better job, although they would have had <laughs> to fire at the same time a bunch of people, which yeah. now it's the trickle uh, effect mm -hmm. that they're going to be they're going to be uh, letting heads roll over the next several months, yeah. and uh, they they they've totally lost that battle. You have to hit the you have to hit the door with the right kind of apology and really mean it. And you're absolutely right. Uh, 
uh, it was a laughable moment when he uh, entered the stage. I said earlier today they, they could hardly have done as badly yeah. unless they brought Hitler back to be their pitch man. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, think, uh, and I think too, too rarely does the, the apology come with a resignation or the offer right. to resign. Exactly. Yeah. Why is that? I'd say too many companies have um, you know, governance that's too tightly embedded in, in one leader. Uh, the chairman, president, CEO um, character who just doesn't have enough board discipline to press them for resignation when it does make sense. Uh, and so you have this ling long, lingering, dragged out uh, episode where finally under, pr under such, pr such pressure, t four, four or five, ten days later, uh, you have a resignation. You know, and then your next wave of stories. You, you know, the same thing's happening right now with United Airlines because there was a mystery mm -hmm. uh, illness with their yeah. CEO last week. And so they just said that he's yeah, been no. admitted to the hospital. Yeah. And then, you know, the next news cycle with a heart condition, <laughs> and then the next cycle, it just keeps coming out, and finally, uh, now the general counsel is gonna be moving up as an interim CEO. Mm -hmm. And then today there was another development. It's just, it's, it's just killing people, and there is, you know, everything is so shrouded in the privacy issues, uh, which he might have requested, or his family might, but he's running a corporation after 43 days he has a heart attack and he's running a company that needs leadership and uh, investors and employees mm -hmm. that are confused and they're not telling their employees anything they're not telling their investors anything and the board is meeting and it's just it's a total mess and again of course they fired the head of communications of uh, and uh, a couple of other people with the last CEO. Um, so it, 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 a company like that, unfortunately, does not have the kind of backup. They have a public relations agency that they're clearly not listening to or they're not bringing mm -hmm. into the fold. And it, it, it's just is watching them flail around like uh, uh, Volkswagen. Is, uh, is, is really concerns me when it could have been handled so much better. And I can't imagine going to the spouse of a CEO and say, we need to do, we need an announcement that just ties it all together. Mm -hmm. And the succession plan says the general counsel is gonna fill in. All of that crisis planning stuff we were talking about okay. earlier today, yeah. uh, it, it just, just went out the window. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what you've described defines what happens too often in corporate America and in other organizations that have a problem, they're protecting an individual at the expense of the organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a standard practice in crisis management uh, that you gotta get the, the truth out there, get it out there quickly. But in some organizations, the corporate culture, which extends to non-corporate entities, is about protecting the powerful guy or gal at the top at the expense mm -hmm. of the organization. And that time delay, it's like justice delayed, is justice denied. Good decision making in a crisis delayed is in, in inviting a worse crisis. The Amateur Athletic Union, the largest organization in the country that engages boys and girls in, in athletic activity, about three years ago ESPN <laughs> did a, an hour-long story about the then president being accused by two middle-aged middle guys, current era, mm -hmm. of having molested them back in the mm -hmm. 80s when he wasn't even the AAU president. Mm -hmm. We were brought in to crisis manage AAU. The president has never been charged with a crime. No one has ever filed a, complete, uh, a police complaint. And our advice was get him out, okay? We're not going to ascribe any guilt to him, but we got to get him out and take the cloud that's over him from being over the organization. They did that three years ago to this day. He's never been charged with anything. But to protect the organization, you've got to get the bad news out of there. And, and a, a leader um, with the confidence and commitment to the organization will take that step. Not always. Uh, not, well, I, right, <laughs> uh, because so, so many of them are committed primarily to their own cause. Uh -huh. But there are Japanese executives who, uh, who have set an example uh -huh. here um, of great embarrassment, sincere apology, and I'm uh -huh. bowing out because I headed this organization uh, and failed because I take responsibility as its leader. I failed you consumers. I failed the citizens, and I, I now step down and allow my successor to right the wrong. I mean, that's pretty powerful 
and uh, very few people are I willing agree. to take it's that It's cultural, step. though. It's not going to happen. Exactly. It, it still it's is not going to happen here. No, <laughs> <I think laughs> There's just too much greenbacks involved. <laughs> I'd probably be surprised if it happened to you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not like these guys can't resign and go you know, live their life very comfortably. It's really more it, about it pride and ego. It all depends what the severance package uh, says and whether they're entitled <laughs> to it. How quickly it will be coming. <laughs> if right. there's something illegal, they're probably not going to see it. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about external communications. You mentioned internal with regard to the airline executive. Um, how important is it to align the external and the internal? I always started with the internal. You, you absolutely exactly. have to have people aligned. And occasionally I would get close to getting in trouble um, with government regulatory authorities right. that would say you told them what and they asked for the time. In the old days, we used to put out... Uh, uh, news, financial news, and we put it on something called a fax machine. <laughs> and they don't, they don't and, know what those are. Yeah, but I, I saw some people nodding. I was really impressed. As faculty, they, it's, they, a museum. Museum. Yeah, it's a museum. <laughs> so, so we we would have we we would decide we had to tell everyone. Associated Press, uh, uh, Dow Jones, Reuters. So we would call everyone in the morning and if we were going to put it out before the market opened. So at 7 o'clock, I had nine people standing at nine fax machines. Mm -hmm. And That's at right. the same time, we would di they'd dial the yes. number and we'd push send. <laughs> and then we'd get the paper proving when we did it. That's right. Because invariably, somebody like Reuters or Dow would call and say, why did Reuters mm -hmm. get it first? Right. Because they went to their fax machine <laughs> before you did. Well, today it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, and so I would say the minute we push the fax machine, I push the fax machine, I, I would push the internal, internal. Uh, news mm -hmm. so they would hear it uh, first. It was, it was it just debilitating if somebody was driving to work and heard that we're going to have layoffs. Of uh, course it is. You know, their car crashes because of That's that. That's right. And, uh, and very, you know, very concerned people. So you, you have to get that news out. And I think companies are doing a lot better job of that when, again, when I started in the profession, the uh, corporate uh, mantra was the CEO first, shareholders right. second, mm -hmm. oh, board second, uh, <laughs> shareholders, and then tell the employees mm -hmm. what they need to know, but tell them to keep working. And mm -hmm. it has totally <laughs> changed. Right. CEOs today understand the importance of their employee base and they are paying a lot more attention than they've ever done in the past because they, they know it's a critical stakeholder. Do you think they think of employees as um, social media uh, access? Yeah. They, they, and they therefore they, are hitting them first? Yeah. They, they're, they're aware of it mm -hmm. and they, you know, for instance, if they're having a staff meeting and something mm -hmm. said, it's being tweeted now. Absolutely. And so they know. So we, we'd prepare them going in saying, just expect that before you're able to come out of that room, you know, you're going to be quoted on that. And, and I think that's why some C-suite executives don't like having those kind of meetings mm -hmm. and why they tell their communications people uh, to, uh, to do that or the brand manager. Or, and they write the communication right. exactly. for an external audience. It's yes. delivered to employees with the expectation right. that it will be widely right. shared immediately. Correct. And it will be. Yeah. Except one of our favorite corporations in Florida, Disney, that has what they call phone jail. And some of my students in here have heard me tell this story before, that when they walk into a meeting, there's a basket at the door, and all of the phones go in the basket. And oh. then we have the meeting. Oh, MJ. So it's not going to be. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> That sounds like the, when my, my kids were young and had parties uh, and uh -huh. probably what shouldn't have been having right, one, right. Uh, what they were drinking at those parties uh, uh, at their age. But so my wife thought that the, the, the best thing to do is have them all put their car keys in a basket. Uh -huh. And that yeah, that's going to protect you when right. the police show up. <laughs> <laughs> I took their keys. I don't think Disney's all wrong. Uh, if I'm having a staff meeting uh, mm -hmm. or manager's meeting, and someone at the table, all right, is in their technology, they're not in the meeting with me. That's true. And if I'm in a client meeting and one of my colleagues is playing with their technology, you know, frankly, there were some things about the old days that were pretty good that, uh, you know, a pad and a pen, I mean, I'm an old reporter and a, a reporter's notebook is still valuable to me. I, I still like taking hard copy notes. For my young people who want to be in there, 
with a, an iPad taking notes. Frankly, I find the sound of the keypad <laughs> distracting to the conversation to somebody. If one client's offended by it, to be in the meeting means to actually connect with the client to make eyeball to eyeball contact if it's that kind of meeting. If it's the kind of meeting we all have our technology and we're putting something out. It's different. But I think you have to discern what those quality level meetings are that require people to use some discipline, even if it's imposed by the boss, to put your technology in your pocket. Uh, and if it's not essential to this conversation, don't use it. I think that that is one of the lines uh, that is largely blurred by the addiction we all have to this technology. And I think, you know, even at dinner with my wife, I'm a part of it. And she says, do you, do you have to have it out on the table? <laughs> and, uh, you know, if the answer is yes, uh, she's not happy. Yeah. So I think we have to self-police ourselves a lot more on this. And in the workplace, it's essential. Comments, fellas? I, 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 uh, uh, I had a boss that would simply say, I need your attention. And we mm -hmm. would, because I was one of those people that did <laughs> I need your attention, and that was a sign that I'm really ticked that everyone in the room <laughs> is sure texting hand. or doing something <laughs> or checking email because we're all busy, and we know it's a, sometimes a three-hour meeting. And mm -hmm. so at, at very given points when he wanted to make sure we were listening, I think it's pretty effective because today I think it's unrealistic to think people are not going to use uh, their devices and some, some faculty members uh, that, that, uh, that I know say nothing, no technology in the, in the, in the classroom. And uh, I can't go there. I, I, I figure you have to manage your own time and it, it'll show up eventually in your assignment if you, you're not. Mm -hmm. But I really, I really think that you do have to say at times, honey, I need your attention. <laughs> okay, so, so, <laughs> and then I put it down. If my wife says that, it goes so, away. <laughs> and the question for all of us is, Where's the line? Where's I was at a wedding no. and a funeral in the past month, and at both of them, people in the church for the wedding or in the church for the funeral were in their technology. I don't mean before. I mean during. And I think that's kind of messed up. Now, you know what a dead guy doesn't know the difference, but <laughs> <laughs> the, the bride does. <laughs> and, and I think that uh, yeah. the other thing, that, uh, uh, one of the best things I saw along those lines, we went to a wedding recently, and on the, the program, uh, it said, please, mm -hmm. uh, no cell phone pictures. We want to share uh, the official photographs or something uh, this moment without the, the distraction. And a couple of people are like, well, that's, I always post wedding pictures, you know? <laughs> and, and, like it's their prerogative. And, yeah, it's like their prerogative. I'm in the audience, I get to post it. And wow. I thought it was really sweet that it was nicely phrased, better than that. And I, I think I've tweeted it because I tweeted that. I took a picture of it and tweeted it from the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> but not a picture of the bride. And, you know, her pictures of herself were a lot better than my pictures of her. <laughs> you know, it's a, generation, it's a generational thing. Uh, and as a client service person, you, you're going to read the uh, attitude of your, your client. If you have, a, like, an older executive who, for whom this is uh, offensive, then you put it in your pocket and you leave it there. Um, I'd say when you all are senior executives in business, you're going to have devices probably yeah. plugged directly into your head. Yeah. Yeah. You know, That's right, and exactly. The thing is, uh, you know, when you're in meetings with devices, it's not as if you're not paying attention. Sometimes they, he says something, she says something, and you want to look it up. Or, you know, add intelligence mm -hmm. to the meeting on the fly, and you are a multitasking generation. And it's, you can do three things at once, and that's just the way your, your brain was, was programmed. Uh, people will get used to that in time, but yeah, you're right. It's there that are times doesn't mean it's a good thing. <laughs> well, it getting may... used to things that aren't always good doesn't make them better. <laughs> I, I can see that. Yeah, and, 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 and you're making it all generational. But, uh, you're giving millennials a pass on good behavior and etiquette just because it's commonplace. I don't. I have three millennial children, mm -hmm. and if we're at a family dinner, uh, put the technology away. Let's. We're so rarely together. It's important to have those moments together. And I think it's wrong to give a blank check, which I don't think you're doing, yeah. but you're giving a pretty, pretty good, you're doing a defense attorney thing license. for millennials. Yeah. And I appreciate you work with them a lot, but so do I. And you do have to refine the line somewhat and help millennials, coach them along about what they're comfortable with and what may be more appropriate than their 
they're not knowledgeable about. Mm -hmm. You're witnessing yeah. executive communication right here. <laughs> There's always a difference of opinion, is there not? Um, we've been talking about technology, but I'd um, like to shift a little bit and get your reactions to um, you know, big data. We are inundated with so much information. How do you think that executives and CEOs are going to be able, as it becomes more and more available, to manage that and to use it in, with regard to uh, communications? Is it even possible? Yeah. Well, they won't be managing it. Um, they will build systems that instantly manage it without human intervention. Um, that's the future. So that it's all this will happen too fast for any executive to, to weigh in and, and manage it. It will be self-managing. Now, what is, and obviously that can go off the rails. Yes. So they're probably the cleanup guy or gal who's going to be explaining how it happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how it happened that they, you know, knew too much, you know, like, oh, <laughs> you know, I've got, uh, let me recommend to you a divorce advisor yes. because we see that your wife's having an affair. That's too much uh, information. We don't think so. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there'll be uh, there's entirely new questions and issues for them to manage. And that, that data exists. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> Madison, right? Readily, absolutely. I, I think the challenge is uh, the big data is here to stay, absolutely. but it's being selective in what you pull from it mm -hmm. and what you share so that you're not boring people, inundating them with a, a lot of data that they need not know. I mean, I don't want to know as much as you know about what you're great at, but I want to know enough to understand what you do and you too. And I think that simplifying the message is important. The, the writer who wrote, uh, I've written you a long letter because I didn't have time to write you a short one, Mark Twain. I think is good advice <laughs> for all of us. Yeah. Um, in the interim, though, what do we do? In managing big data? And yes, and working with all that information constantly. I mean, we're, we're drowning in it, aren't we? I'm feeling that way, at least. Maybe that's my problem. I, I think it's all like selective, it. and what I tell people to focus on is what's relevant to whatever you're mm -hmm. working on. Don't let the rest of it confuse you. And the good thing is the way you can slice and dice it today, you know, I want to know a lot about certain things. I want to know nothing about others. So just give me that mm -hmm. piece of it. So you need to have somebody... Uh, your CIO, whoever's running that function for you. And in many cases, you know, we're now teaching a big data class in, 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 a, in the PR program. You are too here, mm -hmm. I'm sure. And that, that course is really critically important so that students and myself, that we know how to ask the right questions because I don't think we're really going to be managing it. That it's, it's happening too fast and there's so much of it. We simply have to know the questions we need to ask to get the answers are going to help inform what we're going to do in communications. And brands are really desperately trying to deliver to you what you want to know, only what you want to know and yeah. share, and not what you don't want to do. They, do. they understand they do not want to be an annoying advertiser. They want to enable you to become familiar with uh, their brand and make it an important part of you know, solving your life issues and problems. You know, that's what they aim for. That, that will be the success of big data or, or a failure if they can't master that. That's why I'm always amused on Facebook when, when they're asking, you know, does this, why are you deleting this ad? You know, you find it offensive, it's boring yes. or whatever. Yeah. And, and so it's, I used to just go through and answer it all. And now they're getting so specific yeah. that like, oh, they know too much about me. <laughs> and because for a year and a half, I just kept answering all those questions. Now they're so targeted. Yeah, I want to buy that. And how do they know I want to buy that? <laughs> I, I made the mistake of internet searching something, and I a little ad for Tommy John underwear for you guys uh, or you, you gals as Christmas is approaching. It bills itself as the most comfortable men's underwear products ever made. Mm -hmm. I ignored it. And... Uh, I mean, I must have clicked on it once because no matter where I went after that, Tommy John was stalking me. Finally, uh, I broke down and bought like $150 of Tommy John underwear. And I must say, yeah. it is the most helpful I've ever had. So here I'm doing a testimonial for them and they still pop up wherever I am. So. And that was More not... after tonight. <laughs> right. That was not a paid commercial, by the way. Uh, no, no, so to make sure. pick up the transcript and uh, add it to their database. Oh, I love it. Um, I think we've all certainly heard and know that successful communication isn't about what is communicated. It's about how it's received. Do you agree with that? I'd say yes, Why? exactly. Well, 
<laughs> you knew I was going to do that. Right, you know, uh, it's like you and your mom. You mm -hmm. know, you're, it's what you say and it's what she hears. Uh, you know, and she knows you. She knows when you're fibbing. She knows mm -hmm. when it's for real. She has the whole context. And so, yeah, it's not just the words you utter. It's, it's the meaning for the audience, whoever they are. Um, and you, they can easily take offense at something that's intended in, in, in good spirit and, and uh, <clears throat> that's hard to control, but that's the art of communications. If, if I have the time, I always bring home something that I want to uh, say that I think probably needs to be uh, uh, vetted with others. And I sample it with my sons and my wife. And they're the three most honest people that tell me, mm -hmm. oh, here's what I understand that you just said. Oh, that's wrong. i got to rewrite yeah. this. Yeah. So I think testing constantly because what a lot of executives are think they're saying if it's not heard it's right. Not. Mm -hmm. So on the really big issues, we'd focus group it, saying here's what we're planning to say. We'd quickly pull in a, a cross-section of people, say, what, you know, tell us what you hear uh, here. And, and, it, and that's what I love about diversity and the, the need for diverse uh, opinions and, and thoughts in the room because Absolutely. if you don't, uh, you're going to say something potentially offensive mm -hmm. if it's really an important issue. So I, I, think, I think there's very definitely a difference. I, I swear I say things that are clear to me. And then I hear it fed back to me like, oh my God, do I say that? I hope I don't go to jail over it. Uh, it, it really, it, it, I, I think the important stuff has to be uh, shared. That's why I love bringing a team of people in saying, how does this, how does this play? Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. message still matters a lot. Uh, I think today, particularly with new technologies, people, millennials and every other generation wants to access information they want uh, yep. in ways they want to access it. And... Uh, so to be smart means to multi-platform your message uh, to micro-target at times. But in the end, uh, in terms of how people hear mm -hmm. things, if you entertain people and you're trying to sell them something, if you inform them, if you show some heart, which you said mm -hmm. earlier, Steve, I think you build up a reservoir of goodwill, you build a brand, and sometimes the best way to sell is not to sell. For those of you who have never seen a series of uh, commercials for some car dealer somewhere, in the Midwest, it's a series called The Trunk Monkey. Oh, nice. Information today. You mean not tell the truth? <laughs> I was trying to put it a different way. <laughs> <laughs> to spin, if you will. I, I, I think that uh, the best communications <laughs> professionals will hold their ground against a CEO who wants them to withhold information or sugarcoat it or whitewash something. And frankly, uh, you're only worth uh, what you're worth as a communicator if you retain your integrity and trust, uh, just as if you were a journalist. Same goes for them. Same's go, same goes for communications professionals in public relations, in the political world, or the cor corporate world. I've fired clients that uh, wanted to lie or, or do something wrong, and frankly, I think that life's too short to uh, sell out uh, to somebody who won't let you do it the right way. So for uh, students, I wouldn't want to work for somebody who wanted you to uh, shade the truth at all. It used to be. It used, uh, mm -hmm. it, it used to just be common that I'm hiring a, a PR person mm -hmm. to uh, to make us look good and not uh, communicate necessarily. You know, clean up messes and and deal with the media and um, and spin and that and and it's what kills me today is that we're still haunted somewhat in the minds of certain people in the media and others that feel that we're still spinning. <laughs> And instead of communicating, and that, that I think is a big concern. Uh, it's, it's better. Uh, certainly in the C-suite, they now know how valuable the function is, and that's why the demand is only going to continue being greater and greater for the best people to be in the top yeah. communications roles. To justify their existence in the C-suite, not just to be yeah. there because there's Absolutely. a seat supposedly yeah. for public relations there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I just say they're, 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 you do have to pick your battles, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They might want to go over long to praise the company and its initiative. Well, no harm done if the yeah. quote is, you know, 10 sentences long and, you know, no one's going to use that, no. right? But outright misleading or false information, yeah, you have a duty to warn them 
uh, of the risk. And, and I agree to resign and be no party to something like that because it puts you at peril, it puts them at peril, it's mispractice. Um, I was at a conference this weekend where, where the former head of uh, uh, communications for uh, Turing uh, Pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. the ones that raised their, uh, their, their price by 5,000%. Yeah. And um, Craig uh, Rosenberg was in the job for 43 days when that hit wow. the fan. And he wouldn't go into a lot of details on the actual decision to announce that he's leaving. He did say that the CEO, despite what you saw on television, is a genius and that he, he is committed to, to do important things, especially in the areas of drugs that are very limited usage. 6,000 people suffer from the parasite uh, uh, that uh, that drug was treating. It costs money to produce drugs. You know, the problem is he was, you know, swarmy in the way he talked about it and not believable. But other things happen, and so uh, Craig quit. And I think you always, in communications, and it is a tough decision, and we mentioned that uh, in one of our earlier sessions today, it's a tough decision to put your job on the line yes. when you have rent payments, car payments, mm -hmm. and, and the like. But to be effective in corporate communications in any communications role, you have to be willing to quit over mm -hmm. principle. And if your principles are being violated, then that is, if you're willing to do that, you're going to be giving the best advice ever because you really have passion about what advice you're giving to a senior management that might be going down the wrong track. So start your savings plan now. Yeah, that's right. the bank <laughs> so you can walk away from that job. I, I, I totally agree. Yeah, I, I, I never saved harder after I had a job that I didn't like with somebody who didn't listen to me. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's going to be 25%. <laughs> yeah. I'm saving every month. You know, one, one harsh reality, I, I, I wonder if you guys have run into it, and particularly when I was working for uh, Governor Childs. You know, I'm the guy who's got the communications director function, but everyone at the senior staff table believes they know how to do the job. Mm -hmm. And so of course. Uh, I would think in corporate America and political America, even in nonprofits, uh, it's fun to, to play around with communications. People with no skill or experience are often uh, offering the advice, and too often some of them actually catch the ear of the CEO mm -hmm. and can influence them in a way that may not be the best decision on how to do things. Lawyers above all. Oh, yes. Yes, <laughs> especially in crisis. <laughs> well... Thank you, guys. It's been great. I want to have an opportunity for our audience to be able to ask questions. So I think we'll pause for now. I may hit you with another one. Sure. If we don't okay. get too many questions. Good. But My favorite part. Let's let's see if anyone has a question. I, Come I'm, on, I'm, I'm shocked. Our microphones. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, I me, never was suspected too. you had a question. <laughs> uh, well, my question was, when I first uh, studied PR almost 20 years ago, we were already very much talking about the strategic role of PR. Um, and I was very much expecting that the typical position of a senior PR person would be a vice president of PR today. Do you think how much progress do we, or how much progress do we do you think we have made in the last 20 years? T today there are more ch chief communications officers reporting to CEOs than ever before. Ever before. I hasten to say it's not important who you report to, it's what you do in your role and how you're perceived by CEOs. The problem with board of directors today is they're looking at the span of authority that a CEO has. And very often a CEO has way too many people reporting to them. And can you effectively manage in one, one CEO that, that, that uh, I've worked with has 13 direct reports hmm. and everything is reporting there. So his concern was, what do I do about you know, this many reports? Well, where do things logically flow? The communications role uh, went under, uh, and I just said, please, dear God, don't put it under legal. Uh, <laughs> and second, human resources. <laughs> and so just, if, if it's logically done and you do kind of the personality mix of you know, teaming, the right kind of people, it, could, it can work. So I don't get hung up over it, but I'm really encouraged by the number of people. The other thing that's very exciting, touched on a bit today, is the fact that people who are in public relations roles, when they get the right kind of, of uh, development, 
and experience within the organization. They see the, the, the corporation more broadly, and next thing you know, the CMO position opens, and they are getting promoted into positions that they'd never had before. I've seen people now in uh, heads of communications take on HR functions. Strategy, strategy for the corporation, that's just mind-boggling when someone says the PR person knows something about everything and is asking the right questions, so let's put them. Uh, I, I think it's really an exciting time. The talent, though, is we still have uh, fewer people ready to make that move. Uh, and the people who are in a lot of those positions that are not giving up their, the boomers who are up here, I'm not giving up that job right now. It pays a lot of money, and I'm not ready to do anything else because I didn't plan for my retirement, so they're staying there. So over the next five years, I think there are going to be a lot of openings at the top. The problem is there are not enough people who are properly trained to make that next move. So I really would encourage people to do the kind of training and, and getting the experiences that pre prep them for that, that move. And I think one of the reasons there are new opportunities and what will spawn new opportunities is the merger now between corporate communications and brand communications. Mm -hmm. So many companies, the brand is the company yep. mm -hmm. and consumers associate the two. It's not like you can have a corporate PR person advising the CEO, and then a brand PR person working right. with the marketing director, and they're they're misaligned. You know, they the brands are making some crazy social post that's offensive, and the CEO is suddenly answering for it. There needs to be more integrity, and perhaps then that create does create an opportunity for that communications executive to rise in the organization and be that umbrella that unifies the message. I, so. I would also say the. Uh, you know, the interaction and convergence of the various disciplines here at the, at the College of Journalism. The students coming out today from UF and from other schools where I've made hires are really smart. And they have a skill set. And I think the best news I would have for millennials is you know, put down the device when you're at dinner with your parents, okay? <laughs> but know that you don't have this waiting period to be leaders, that you can emerge from college and within the very first few years of your career, Make a name for yourself by virtue of the quality of your confidence in your competence. But you have to have the competence, and you do. And you don't have to wait 10 years, 15 years, 20 years to vault up the corporate ladder or the organizational ladder in politics and business and not for profits because your leadership can be applied now. And I, I think you made the point well that there is a generational divide about some of the new media. Your comfort level using these tools and showing how they can best be applied for an organization is going to help you in your career. And your ability to write effectively and to speak effectively also gives you a greater skill set than most executives I know. And so I think you should be very buoyed about your futures. I think your comment about competence and confidence, because I see lots of competence, but I sometimes see that our students don't have the confidence. Mm -hmm. You're right. You can, be, you can be in one of those very top jobs in your 20s. Absolutely. If you're good and you work hard, happening more and more. It happens. It's very easy to happen. So it's up to you. That's the best part. Questions? Oh, we're not going to let Jasper be the only person, are we? Come on, head to the microphone if you would. So, as uh, CCOs or PR counselors, we often, we often have a lot to offer to the CEO. But the question is whether they will listen to us. So, my question is whether you have some suggestions on how to empower the public relations function in the organizations and how to show the value of public relations to the top management. Data. Data. I mean, these totally. are folks who respond uh, to data. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, opinion, professional practice and experience, that doesn't go very far right. these days. Uh, I vividly recall, and this is my big wake-up call, um, a very large brand that you would all know, and they had a slew of agencies they bring together every quarter into a giant room, practically the size of this one, and in the morning, the digital agencies would present their results one after the other. <laughs> in the afternoon, the PR firm, the advertising agency would present their results, and th it was no shockingly night and day. In the morning, they could say, here's a strategy that moved your sales 50%. This is where you need to invest more of your money. 
in the afternoon, it was vague, puffery <laughs> impressions uh, with no direct ties, not, not, not even, frequently not even a measure of engagement. What's more, no, no drive to sales. So who do you think is going to rise in that kind of s setting? Data. So we've got to bring data to the table. And, 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 ahead, please. <laughs> no, go ahead. You're in the middle. We, we, we were, <laughs> we were uh, when I was at Sears, uh, it, I learned the data lesson. Because the, the marketing people, and advertising specifically in this case, would say, if we put a washer and dryer in the upper right-hand corner of the preprint on Sunday, we're going to sell X number of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that is such bull. And they did. Wow. <laughs> and so what happens? Let's give them more money. And everyone's vying to be in certain locations in that preprint. And I'm like, ha, ah, you know, I think I have to start finding. So then all of a sudden we were using no money on public relations research and, and uh, any form of data. And I said, let's just take 3% of our budget mm -hmm. and start making sure that we can measure things we're doing and follow the measurement. All of a sudden, every one of my memos had some results feature. And... And one, but the, the, the crowning uh, moment, uh, there may have been two, but the one that, that strikes me is one day we're in a, in a meeting and they're saying, we have no idea why shoes soar like this. Uh, on that. And so I said, oh, well, here's the reason. You know, we did a pre-advertising launch for a new line of uh, shoes. We did some PR. Now we lucked out because the New York Times picked up the story. And it went everywhere, and it was, it was a phenomenal story. And as a result, uh, everyone was reading about it. They found out that, oh, we're buying, uh, we're, if we go to Sears, we're buying the same shoes that we're going to Nine West and other places for at 40% less money. And so, you know, it, it, it skyrocketed. That alone had us moved right into the marketing mix. And what else can you deliver? And then we had kids apparel and women's, uh, uh, the men's apparel area. Um, I have a hunch we can deliver and PR is going to do great things and we're going to get your product in the news, but the minute we're able to use data, we won the argument. I, I, I like the data thing, I like the research and, and it should be coming from communications people and PR people, but I, I think the other thing is attitudinal. Uh, you can't be locked into a feeling that in the corporate structure, or whatever structure it is, that our opinions are secondary in importance and relevance to the chief financial officer, uh, the chief risk officer, the general counsel. So I think I go back to this confidence in your competence. You gotta be willing in a polite but pushy way to assert thought leadership to the boss. You gotta come up with great ideas, brainstorm internally, uh, do some research, and get out there and be bold, and, and you may get shot down, but once you get a chance to get some traction with a CEO, and one of your initiative ideas gets embraced and enacted and shows results, then I think you have their ear going forward. And I think it's that, that stepchild mentality, thinking that the, in the old days of just some puffery, put out a press release, uh, you know, get the corporate report ready, that's not who communicators are today. So I think we gotta get out of that, that old model in the mindset, certainly it's not the function anymore, but the mindset has stayed behind sometimes, uh, and I think that it's time to shake it up, uh, shake it off, and emerge and assert to the CEO. Again, I say in a polite but pushy way. I've been pushed out of CEO's offices, uh, including governors of Florida, by the shoulder saying I don't like that idea, but it didn't stop me from coming back the next day. And calling out a competitive threat is another way to capture mm -hmm. their attention. Yes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. That challenging, but being able to back it up with the data, and that's the thing I think we have advantage today that we didn't have at one time. Yeah. That we really can Absolutely. produce that data quickly. Research took a while, right. sometimes. Now we've got it uh, beforehand, so don't be afraid to challenge. Other questions? Oh, yeah, I'm going to be search. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm going to start applauding the, the questions. <laughs> to know your opinion about how the NFL handed the Ray Rice incident. I personally was surprised that Goodell stayed in his position, considering that the NFL didn't react until the media got a hold of it. And then TMZ ended up exposing the video. I mean, it just seemed like 
they separated the bad guy from the organization. They definitely targeted Ray Rice's actions, which I don't feel like it was right what he did. However, I do feel like he was honest and forthcoming, but the NFL wasn't. So we held Ray Rice to some standard that we didn't even hold the organization to. So just wondering what your opinion was on that. I think, it's a good uh, uh, you know, <laughs> it's important to take the adequate time to get all the facts in a big organization or a small organization involving something uh, big or little, but this was big. Uh, I think they took too much time in a finding a fact, and I think that reasonable people will disagree about whether the NFL hid something or not, but I share your belief that it's a surprise the commissioner kept his job because, frankly, that was too much time to take action. And, you know, on the same line of thought, I wonder how Bill Cosby gets booked into any venue to do his comedy routine when you've got dozens of accusers standing up against him. It's not a conspiracy against Bill Cosby. The culture has changed, too, and what might have been tolerated or uh, people looked away about today is no longer tolerated. And I think that's one of the best things about the culture changing is that people are willing to call out bad behavior, whether it's racial, sexism, uh, a parent upbraiding a child uh, to the extreme in a public supermarket. I think that's a good thing about where we are today. But organizations like the NFL uh, don't have to rush to judgment. They have to be reasonable in doing it timely and make a good decision when they announce it. And in this case, uh, two of those things probably aren't true. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is that with the NFL, um, follow the money. And he has a couple dozen bosses, the owners. And I'm sure the, there, there was a reality check with each of them as to wh where we need to go with this. And so uh, if they weren't voting thumbs down, uh, stay the course and see if this thing blows over. And if they're not getting blowback from uh, their season hold, uh, ticket holders and they, they, they think that there may be an uproar in the public, but it's not affecting the people who are coming through the gates, uh, then we have some time to uh, see if this thing will blow over. And that's, that was what they did. He is hugely successful in making a lot of money for these teams. And they're looking at, it's hard to find a CEO that has the skill set that he has and how totally disruptive it would be to an organization if he left. So I'm sure somebody along the way, hopefully his public relations advisor said something to the effect that you, boss, we could have done this better, but they're not gonna replace a, an effective CEO that easily. At the same time, the next step is they've got to do a better job of reaching out to women. Oh, yeah. And because they'd like them in the audience and they'd like their support. Um, and that That's sent right. a, a very bad signal, of course. Um, they've got to find a way around that. I, I'll just add, it, it is complicated. Even when it's a big public figure like that, they are also an employee of the organization. So there is some complexity when you handle communications about misconduct of an employee. Um, but still, the delay was... Yeah. You know, damning. Other questions? Come on up. Okay. Um, what was the biggest challenge you gentlemen faced um, as a young professional getting into your leadership roles, and how did you uh, overcome them so that I may do the same? It's <laughs> uh, wow. a practical question. Oh, good. She yes. always is. Uh, <laughs> Wow. Uh, you know, I just told the story to the, uh, in the diversity session today that uh, I was, uh, I came out at a very young age, um, uh, like 20 or so, 20 or so. So when I entered the profession, I was coming out of a performing arts career. I was just doing um, business on the side to make, to make money. Um, and I was out from, the, from day one. Um, but I do, and I didn't take business that seriously. Over time, I realized that's kind of cool. I like this. It's a meritocracy. You do good work and you get paid for it. And the environment really allows you to do good work. And so I became more enfranchised as a business person. I, I thought that was for the dumb jocks. You know, no, I actually like business. And I was well prepared for it. Uh, but I think, you know, I look back at my career and I wonder uh, to what extent um, my uh, professional advancement might have been constrained by that. You know, I, I'm 30 years in, in the agency business, right? Might I have had more offers, more opportunity, and might I have had greater ambition for myself, seen more possibilities, 
um, if I didn't, weren't, weren't operating under that, um, you know, the current picture of management, right? So for women, it's the same way. Exactly. You look at the leadership of, in our industry, and it's, you know, it's excessively white male. So uh, I would say don't let that constrain your ambition because it won't always be that way. Change is underway. Um, and it may be dramatic. Sometimes things don't change gradually. Sometimes there's a big shift. And that could happen, particularly as America becomes much more of a multicultural place where emotional and societal intelligence are of greater <laughs> importance. You could see some substantial shifts, particularly with the generational change that Ron mentioned. Uh, so have high ambition and don't let anyone discourage you along the way. And if you are discouraged in an organization, think about another organization where you can yes. realize your potential. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Never plan too far ahead. The, I, I, when I, when I got, got my first corporate job at Eli Lilly, uh, the guy next to me, who happens to live in Florida now in Jacksonville, uh, he had a five-year plan. And every, every six months he was updating it. And that man was so frustrated uh, exactly. He, he was like, okay, he just kept moving it down the road. And, and he, he was miserable, and it showed. Uh, and I'm sitting next door to him, and I loved every assignment, even if I couldn't stand it. You know, I'd smile and say, oh, give me more of that. You know, I, 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 I really want to make, I just want to learn everything I can. So throw yourself into the moment and not worry about the future so much. Uh, but at the, then at a certain time, you have to say, okay, I've been doing this this long. What's next? And it's either going to happen for you there. If you see all the logos that I have behind my name on my resume, <laughs> uh, I moved around a lot. And you guys are going to move around even that much or more. Mm -hmm. I think they're saying now 17 t uh, different jobs for millennials. Wow. And I had... 16, so i got one more to go. Um, You're an honorary millennial. I, I wish I were. I have so much more I want to do. But the, the uh, uh, know, know when to hold them and know when to fold mm -hmm. them. Uh, play a little poker here. That if it's working for you, stay there, love it, and all of a sudden you're noticed. I had no game plan. I had no idea I'd be successful in this profession. And the next thing I know, every opportunity came along from whatever mm -hmm. I was in. And I, oh, that sounds like fun. I didn't look at it as a golden ring ever uh, or something I had planned. Oh, that sounds like fun. Go home, discuss with my wife. We have to move to New York. Well, that could be cool. <laughs> and uh, and, and going to move to Indianapolis. Yeah, that's great. You know, nice place to raise a family. So we just, we, you know, we had a little tea graph, and then we'd make the decision. But don't overthink it. Poor, my buddy next door was totally frustrated because, and, to this day, he hasn't achieved <laughs> even his first five-year plan. Underperformer, huh? <laughs> yeah, and, and he had all of the skill set to be there. He was so busy trying to be something that, that was not authentic that it didn't work for him. I, I would, uh, just in, in, in building on, on what these good guys have said, um, you know, I'm a dad. The three daughters are millennials. A couple of them came from uh, the University of Florida. Uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Florida. You're coming out of school. Uh, as well prepared as anybody in the country for the career you're embarking yeah. on. And even if you don't go into communications, the skills that you have sharpened here, oral and written and digital and everything, are going to be applied by you to make you more likely to be successful than your peers, rivals, and competitors who don't have this background, training, <laughs> and capability. I would say to you, for that first job, uh, if I were advising you about your love interest, don't settle for a love interest who's not worthy of you, somebody who doesn't respect you, make you feel good about yourself. I apply that same metric to searching for your first job. Right. And uh, at the risk of your parents not liking me, but they're not in the room, <laughs> I would say hold out, hold out for something worthy of you. You never really know until you're in the job. But if you're going in for a job interview and you see people who look stressed and not happy, um, why would you want to go there? I understand the pressure, student loans, your parents don't want you coming back home. All right? I would say I'd rather deliver pizzas than start my career out by taking a job at a place where I'm going to be like most people in America, miserable at what I do. And if you do that with your first job out of college, you are settling. You're not going to settle in your love life, hopefully. Why would you settle in your professional life? And if you do that right out of school, you're setting a bad pattern for your career. And it's going to lead to you possibly being one of those take this job and shove it kind of people 
uh, but too deep into your career. Once you're in a place, if you said, gee, it's not really not a good fit for me, bail. Get out, do it with dignity and respect. Don't burn the bridge, never burn the bridge. All right. The other thing I would say to you, and this is unbelievable, the simplest piece of advice I can give you, in an interview with somebody for a job, make eye contact. Hmm. I can't tell you the number of people who come to see me uh, and people deep into their career, middle-aged people and right out of college, who can't make eye contact when I'm listening to them or, or they're listening to me. And one guy is looking at a spot on the wall behind my desk, and I got out of my chair, <laughs> and I walked over and said, what the hell is so interesting up there? And so, uh, and, and again, obviously you can't make eye contact if you're in your devices, all right? So, you know, don't walk in with your device, but it's unbelievable the power of that connection of eyeball to eyeball. You know, when you toast somebody, if you don't make eye contact when you toast someone, you might as well have spit in their drink, all right? <laughs> Let the same thing be true in a job interview. The last thing I'll tell you, I meet with anybody who wants to meet with me. I'm a CEO, I got a $5 million a year company, 32 employees, I'm in a lot of philanthropic efforts and all that stuff. If somebody thinks my time is important for them to have some of it, I am meeting with them, even if I don't have a job. And I can tell you there was a time in my life when I was down on my luck, and I couldn't get those meetings, all right? Mm -hmm. And I swore to myself, I won't be that guy. I'll be the guy who will meet with you. And it's unbelievable the empowerment of the nurturing conversation, the encouragement you can give to somebody, even if you don't have a job. And if someone tells you they don't have a job, respect them enough to say, I'd still like to meet with you if you're willing to meet with me. Who wouldn't want that? And if they do meet with you, they're likely to see how sharp you are, how smart you are, how great your eye contact is. And you may end up wangling a job or an externship out of a situation you didn't even know existed. So eye contact, I think, is the key. Handshake. Handshake. And handshake. Oh, of course. A good one. Okay. Good handshakes <laughs> in this room so far. I've got to say something else. Too. And, and it's just because I, I've delivered this lecture to everyone who's ever started with us ever, because I've seen the fatal flaws. Your first assignments will insult your intelligence and <laughs> underutilize your training. Okay? Uh, that, yeah. Yeah, you might be making photocopies but make the best damn photocopies that were <laughs> ever made. Um, it's just important that you do everything well because if your managers see that everything you do is prompt, accurate, perfect, above and beyond, then they will give you more stuff quickly. They are desperate to dish off responsibilities to people they think can manage them. So if you do that, you'll go a long way. And the other thing I say is, in school, you can make a mistake an error uh, on every project you're given. And what do you make? Straight A's. One mistake? Good, I'm sailing through, A plus. If you do that in the workplace environment, then what does it make you? Not a fire, maybe. <laughs> oh, you know, a flake, right? You can, I can't trust you to get anything perfect. That's, just, that's not gonna fly. So really, you have to custom yourself to that higher Very standard, nice. and it will take you a long way. I have a young woman, she interned with us two years later, uh, she has a, step, a chance to step into the interim leadership of a nearly a million dollar account. And I trust her very much to do that. Mm -hmm. Why? Everything's been, it, she's moving at exactly. rapid pace up the scale. Just because she's ready, she's willing, and she's getting it all right. Another practical piece of advice. Uh, as a former reporter and editor, for some reason, I just have this weird uh, vision when I'm looking at a piece of copy where I can find the mistake, the typo, the missing <laughs> word the poorly phrased sentence, uh, and other people miss them, but particularly typos. And if you turn in a piece of work, I love your point here, uh, to a, a manager or a boss, and you haven't like reviewed it three or four times, asked someone else to do it, and you give it to me, and I'm the guy who's gonna find the mistakes you didn't, um, you're not gonna last long in the organization. I mean, quality, attention to detail, accuracy. Actually, in school here, I had the late Buddy Davis as a journalism <laughs> professor, and if you got a fact there, you misspelled the name, got an address wrong, or an age wrong in a story for a make-believe newspaper, you got a zero on the paper. I like that attention to accuracy, and it is more applicable in the professional world than in the scholastic one, but here, there's zero tolerance for fact errors at the mm -hmm. UF. I like right. that. That's good. One of the things, and I think some of us can think back on having had, you know, which I did 25, 30 year career in the industry, the one piece of information I would give you, and I experienced it when I could look back over that career, that I think a lot of my success at certain junctures came from simply paying attention, 
seeing an opportunity when it presented itself. We sometimes get so busy doing the work that we're doing and the opportunities just fly past us. So perform well. I support that completely. But also pay attention because there could be something great just sitting there waiting for you. And um, the great element of surprise that you'll often have when someone says, you're fabulous, like they, you said to this, this person in yep. your organization. And everyone you know. wants to work with her. Can, yes. I have, can I have some of her time? Exactly. Can I have her on my account? Yeah. I, I have to add one more thing. And <laughs> build your network. Yes. You're starting it now. Make sure everyone in this room is in it. And when you get on the job, because what is so interesting, I'm currently helping um, a former journalist who, uh, after a 35-year career, is out of work. And, of course, he wants yeah. to get into public relations. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 we've got to figure out other things to do, but he's not, he, not going to kind of get the job that he really wants to get out of this. He has absolutely no network. His entire career has been focused on doing a good job in a very narrow space. And so we're just starting to broaden you know, the, the network for him beyond that. And a lot of young people get in, and that first job is really going to be demanding. They're going to want you to be 110% billable. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> they're, going to, they're going to want you to be working all the time. So you, you think you don't have enough time, but you've got to have time. So you're going to go to PRSA events, and you're going to go to places where you can meet people who have similar interests, and you're going to make those contacts, and you're going to make sure that you have a LinkedIn profile that is good and has at least 500-plus uh, uh, contacts. Do all those kind of things because what happens is that's how you're going to be discovered. Your LinkedIn profile is far more important than a couple of the work, uh, you were working on your resumes today. Forget your resumes. Work on LinkedIn. That's where you're going to be discovered. And that's what everyone's checking. So build that network and start immediately because <laughs> you never know if all of a sudden you lose a million-dollar account. Mm -hmm. uh, guess what happens? Mm -hmm. Someone has to leave. That's right. yeah. That's how it and works. you, if you're the person who wants, uh, it has to leave. You want to be able to pick up the call and say, uh, "Aaron, uh, are they hiring over at Edelman?" <laughs> uh, you want to make sure that you have a network, and too many people don't. Uh, also, some of the practical things like eye contact. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, uh, I've I've never had a job I didn't like except for the one day as a student here. I shoveled sheep manure at the uh, ag school. I knew I could do better than that. <laughs> and I, I think everything since then has been a, a climb up. But, but you did it uh, well, yeah. right? No, I didn't. I had the wrong shoes for it, and I, I, just, I, I just knew it wasn't for me. Uh, it was a good decision at the time. But I, I, I can't tell you how important it is, and, and maybe it's the journalism background, but being on time, I mean, the most simple <laughs> thing in the world, accounting for traffic, accounting for anything else, and, and particularly with the ability to set three alarms on your iPhone, there's absolutely no excuse for the dog ate my homework and my alarm didn't go off today. And if you show up on time for work, you're, you're kind of five or ten minutes late, ready to work. I mean, it's not like a concentration camp, but uh, particularly for people tracking time and productivity and all that. I see a millennial roll in the office 15 minutes after the start time for the workday. I feel disrespected. Mm -hmm. I feel the workplace is disrespected. I feel the clients are disrespected. And if I'm meeting in the conference room and I can see the street and at, you know, 531, the millennials are stampeding out the door, I feel similarly disrespected. Now, you've got to measure that against the Morgan & Morgan, the law firm coming <laughs> after you for wage and hour violations. But, but I mean, if it's a punch the clock, I'm in at 8.30, I'm out at 5.30, and you don't seem to care about anything except just the, the paycheck, um, really is the opportunity for you. So I think showing a work ethic when you're finished with an assignment, going to a manager saying, there's something else I can do to be helpful to you right now, you know, copying anything, it's going to get you noticed in good ways. Being late, noticed in bad ways. Yeah. So true. Well, I hope we've shared some insights that were helpful for you. Um, you certainly have a wealth of uh, years experience. Is that okay that I said that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <You're Right>. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate your coming this evening. I will take over from now.